Hello and welcome to our March edition of Bible Question and Answer. I'm Pastor Paul from Calvary Chapel, Ontario, and I'm here with my wife, Sue, recently back from Europe. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that maybe right, at the end. Sure. And uh, we're here to do a Bible Question and Answer for you. These are questions you've been giving us. We've uh, accumulated them uh, from email, from our YouTube channel, uh, our Facebook page. Uh, boy, how else? do we get these things however they come in <laughs> yeah any, basically any way you get a question yeah. to us um yeah i think probably mo wouldn't you say the most effective way is if people email sure or right on right on the website that is yeah. a great way is yeah. uh, send a contact on the website or to uh write a note to the office is good too yeah yeah so i think we got quite a few uh, good questions for uh this month yeah and i'm so. going to start with these first two that i'll read both of them because they're related both robin and christina asked questions about easter and passover oh okay phrasing it this way why is easter and passover almost a month apart this year and i think i kind of have noted that the last few years they've almost been the same weekend and mm. now they are very far apart yeah uh, robin says this doesn't make any sense to me in connection with the crucifixion of christ and then christina asked the same question why do christians celebrate easter as opposed to passover if easter or resurrection sunday is about the death and resurrection of Jesus, won't that celebration take place after Passover each year? And here it's a month before this year. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, the answer to both questions is has to do with the, the Jewish calendar, which you know, was originally and, and has been tied to solar and lunar cycles and that sort of thing. And so because the moon changes and, and the, the cycle of, of, of the earth and the moon relationship to the moon, those things change. They're not consistent yeah. every year. So people read in the Bible that, you know, they, they were celebrating Passover essentially when Jesus was on the cross. Right. And then three days later or on the third day, actually, as the Jews reckoned days, which was basically just Friday to Sunday, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have resurrection days. So they're like, well, why are we, why is there all these days now between the Passover and uh, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus? And that's the answer. It's just has to do with the ever changing uh, lunar calendar. Aren't you glad that we can just pick a day and say this, we will commemorate it on yeah. this day. Yeah. And, okay. and, and it doesn't really matter. It's just that this is sure. the day. Yeah. All right. So Amara said, should Christians always give to beggars on the street? Is it an obligation for us? Well, you know, the Bible communicates an obligation to be kind to the poor. Um, and I think that that we could actually say that there is an obligation. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says when you are kind to the poor, you 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 give to the Lord. Yeah. There's a kindness expressed even unto God. So the Lord, I think, wants us to be givers. He wants us to be cheerful about it. We certainly know that. The problem arises in the fact that not all beggars are honest in the way that they're begging and, and or we may be actually giving to people who are planning on abusing the, the money that we give. Um, sometimes they'll hold up a sign saying, you know, I'm hungry, please give. Well, we've had people in our church who have been near areas where people do that sort of begging and have worked in some of the local stores. And they've told us that those people will gather some money and then they'll come in and buy beer yeah. and then go out and, you know, drink themselves into oblivion for a period of time and then go back out on the streets and, you know, look for more money. So we know that happens. In fact, yeah. I think you and I were driving around recently and there was a lady who put a sign there and just said, I'm out of beer. I'm out of beer. Yeah. And so, you know, and you know you all, the, I really appreciated that. At least she was being honest. Right. Exactly. But you know what? I didn't stop to give her money right? because that's not something I personally want to encourage. And so I think that there is such a thing as giving, but there's also such a thing as responsible giving sure. and mm -hmm. that we need to be generous f for sure. But we also need to be responsible. And if I don't know that person and what they're going to use that money for, no, I'm not probably just going to hand them over money. If I want to be really generous and loving, I might pull over uh, when I see someone begging and saying, can I take you over to, the, you know, this store, the restaurant over here and get you 
lunch sure. can I buy you dinner and and even stay there with them while they eat it you know um, that would be much more a responsible way of being generous mm -hmm. so yeah. responsibility with discernment hey that's an excellent way Thank why you. didn't I think of that <laughs> that's yeah, what you have good. me for that's right <clears throat> all right George from YouTube asks you do people have some kind of set rules in their mind from birth do people have God's words pre-programmed from birth you know, that's a really interesting way of asking, is, yeah. isn't it? And, and mm -hmm. I don't think people have God's word pre-programmed, but the Bible does tell us that God has given a conscience uh, to all of mankind. And a, and a conscience is, is sort of like a moral compass that, uh, that people have, which is a, an innate sense of right and wrong and our conscience can become troubled when we do something that is wrong the problem with a conscience is that it can also be defiled we know that you know the apostle paul talks about people whose consciences have been seared right. mm -hmm. um, which literally means it, it gives you the picture of like an, uh, an, uh, what, what, what occurs with an animal when they've been branded. Mm -hmm. There's a hard, crusty surface, you know, to the skin of an animal when it's been branded. And the same thing can sort of happen with a, a person's conscious, uh, conscience, where it becomes hard, crusty, and insensitive. Yeah. Um, we also, uh, we, we hear, the Bible uses interesting terms related to the conscience. Paul talks about those who have a weak conscience. Hebrews talks about those who have an evil conscience. So we know that a conscience can become corrupted through influence. So it's not a perfect sort of a situation. Um, in fact, it's in uh, 1 Timothy 4, uh, the first couple of verses where Paul writes that the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are mm -hmm. seared. Mm -hmm. And that's, so there's a passage right there. So a conscience is given to us from God an innate sort of a moral compass, but it can be corrupted through sinful behavior and influence. Mm -hmm. And that's why the more the more the much more superior thing to a conscience is the indwelling of the holy sure. spirit which comes into believers uh, to convict us of sin and that mm -hmm. cannot be corrupted Roxanne wants to know when we pray does God change his position because of our prayers or is it us uh, who are changed by prayer I really like this question and I have to tell you something I've changed my answer. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> because of teaching through the word. Well, just because of considering the word a little more. Mm -hmm. I used to, and I think other people have have also fallen back on a passage from the book of Numbers. Uh, it's in chapter 23 that goes like this: God is not a man that he should lie, mm -hmm. or a son of man that he should change his mind. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, "Has he said?" And will he not do it or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? And what what is being said there is God isn't going to say one thing and do another. Right. And, and I have used that passage in the past as a proof mm -hmm. text that God won't change his mind. And then along comes Hezekiah's illness. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it, and there are several other biblical examples sure. where there was a word given and mm -hmm. then a reversal or or, an, or a change yeah. of, of some element of what that word was. And so I think, I do think we have to be careful mm -hmm. as we trod in this area and deal with, because we're dealing with a sovereign God, but there are times that I think through prayer, God will alter 
And well, I don't know if fair, you can refer to it specifically as a change of mind. Could, is it fair to say God responds to the actions of the prayers and the actions of his people? Uh, yes, it is. And yeah. I think that's a very good way to put it. In fact, I was stumbling for something mm-hmm. that good. So, yes, I think that that is very much a possibility. Sure. And, you know, if, you know, he told Moses at one point, he says, just he says, get away from from me. I'm, sure. I'm going to he basically told him, I'm going to wipe these people out, yeah. the people of Israel when they had sinned. And I'll start over again. Yeah. And Moses interceded and and God God relented, Mm -hmm. you know, from that disaster. So uh, the, the, like, like we're told in the scripture, the prayer uh, of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Susie Starr uh, from YouTube says, why would you continue to use a version of the Bible that has been altered so drastically? She must be talking about your ESV. For a preacher seeking God's word, I do not understand that. I read the King James Bible. It's supposed to be as authentic as possible. Please answer. Cheers. Cheers to you too. Uh, I'm glad that that Susie asked this question because I do get it from time to time. And I'm glad that she even made the statement, it is supposed to be as authentic as possible Mm -hmm. because that is just simply not true. Yeah. Uh, It is, I'm not saying it, it is not authentic, but it is not more authentic than the English Standard Version or the New American Standard Bible or the New King James or even the New International Version. There is there is no greater authenticity uh, to the King James Bible than there is any of these others. What Susie and I think a lot of other people wrongly assume or they're told because there's a lot of misinformation Mm -hmm. flying around concerning the King James Bible. But what many people are told or assume is that The King James Bible is the authentic version of the Bible, and all of the others really have to match up to it. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. The authentic version of the Bible are the original languages. The Bible was written in in Hebrew, the Old Testament, and the New Testament uh, in Greek and with uh, some smattering of Aramaic. And, you know, we don't have the original autographs any longer. We have copies of copies, but we do have the Bible in the original languages languages that in which it was written and all Bible translations whether you're dealing with the King James that was first translated in 1611 Mm -hmm. or if you have the ESV or the New American Standard Bible or whatever they all go back to the original Mm -hmm. all of them they all go back to the original Hebrew for the Old Testament they all go back to the original Greek and Aramaic for the New Testament they all do now here's the point The King James Bible was translated in 1611. There were gaps of the Old Testament that we didn't have. You know, as far as Hebrew, the Hebrew version of of the Old Testament at the time. Uh, So when the King James translators... So can I pause you for a minute? So they had to take it from the Latin. Well, that's the point I was about to make. What what they had of the Old Testament, they had had some Hebrew manuscripts, Mm -hmm. but but there were gaps in some of those. And so they had to refer to a translation of the Hebrew into Greek. Mm -hmm. It was not Latin. It was Mm -hmm. Greek called the Septuagint. And they had to actually refer refer to the Septuagint to fill in some of the gaps they had in the Hebrew. Um, So in other words, the early 1611 translation of of the Bible was in some places a translation of a translation, because remember, this is being brought into English. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, in, in the years since the original King James Bible was translated, we've uncovered much better and much older manuscripts Mm -hmm. of the Bible, older than what they had back in 1611. Mm -hmm. Many people believe those older transcripts are better, those older manuscripts. So other people debate that. Some people say, well, older isn't necessarily better. But that's a debate or a talk for another time. The point is, we have really, really, really good Uh, manuscript evidence for the Bible better than what they had when the original King James 400 years have gone by well not (laughs) only that's a lot of archaeological uh, uncovering not just for manuscripts but for other understandings of word usage sure we've 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 uncovered other things that help us to understand how those words were used in regular life that have helped give us a more 
profound and and rounded uh, version of of uh, understanding the you know the word of god keep in mind keep in mind something people and i would say this to anybody who who believes that the king james bible is really the only bible translation that can be relied upon the king james translation didn't come along till 1611 okay that's the 17th century so until the 17th century there wasn't a king james bible so what were, what were people relying on before that? Well, you know, people were relying on what we had of the original manuscripts. The King James wasn't the first Bible to be translated into English. John Wycliffe was doing that before the King James translators got around to it. He paid with his life mm -hmm. for doing it. But there were others who were translating the Bible and doing a really good job of it even in for English speakers. So I don't want to anybody to think that I'm putting down the King James Bible. If you prefer the King James over any other Bible translation, God bless you. God bless you. But it doesn't mean that, and you should not believe anyone who says mm -hmm. that, the, the, that the King James Bible is better than any of the other more modern English translations. One more thing I want to say about this, and then uh, I will be done. I get questions a lot from people who say, why is this word missing in the ESV right. or the NIV or the New American Standard Bible? For example, there's a passage where Jesus talks about uh, what is required to cast out some demons. Right. Um, this comes out only by prayer and fasting. Well, mm -hmm. in the ESV, it just says by prayer. The yeah. word fasting is missing. People assume it's been the, removed. That the, it's been removed. Right. The fact of the matter is, for the ESV translators who went back and looked at the original Greek, the word fasting wasn't there. It's not there. It's not in the Greek original manuscript, right? The one that they're relying on because different Bibles rely on different manuscripts right. to translate the Bible. So they didn't remove a word. It wasn't in the Greek. In fact, there's reason to believe that the words and fasting were added later and that they weren't original to what Jesus said. Yeah. So it's, you know, people have to be so careful about what they hear. There, again, there's so much misinformation on the internet, in book form and elsewhere. Sure. And it's called the King James only controversy. Mm -hmm. And it is a pack of lies. Mm -hmm. It is, I will just tell you right now, it is an absolute pack of lies. And people have believed it hook, line, and sinker. And it's really unfortunate. It really is. All right, good answer. Paula says in Romans 6, 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says we're baptized into Christ and his death. Since this has nothing to do with water, why do we continue to baptize today? Well, first of all, I think I need to explain why Paula is saying what she's saying. Because I say this when I'm teaching through Romans 6 and the word baptize comes up. I tell people that the word baptize doesn't always refer to water baptism right. because the word baptize means to immerse. Mm -hmm. And the Bible does talk about us being immersed into Christ, which happens at salvation. Water baptism is a picture of being immersed into Christ because we're being immersed into water. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're giving a picture of what happens when we come to know Christ as our Savior. So when, when she says it has nothing to do with water baptism, I wouldn't go that far. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the word baptize is... is means more than water baptism, but it certainly can mean water baptism. Sure. Okay. So she goes on to say, why do we continue to baptize today? And the reason we baptize people is because we were told to. Um, Matthew 28, 19, which was part of the Great Commission, says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's why we baptize. Yeah. All right. An anonymous um, <clears throat> viewer asks, what significance does it hold that the Bible speaks about the Sabbath and tithing even before the law was given through Moses? Mm -hmm. I've heard pastors and a few believers speaking of tithing and making Saturday as the Sabbath, emphasizing that those things appear in Scripture before God gave the law to Moses. Yeah, I have too. And, and that's a very good question. Um, mm -hmm. 
honestly, it doesn't, it, it, it really doesn't matter because God factored uh, the Sabbath and tithing into the law. Right. So he took these things which did predate the law, I'll grant you that. And he took those and he factored them into the covenant. The fact that that they predate the law doesn't mean that we absolutely we have to consider those commands for the present day because we are under a different covenant. We know that 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 those things are part of the old covenant. They're not part of the new covenant. And so the fact that they predate the law doesn't necessarily, I don't think that's an argument mm -hmm. for saying that we are therefore commanded yeah. to do those things because in the New Testament, we don't see commands for keeping the Sabbath or for tithing specifically we see you know we don't see any command for any special day and as far as giving goes the bible says let every man give according to what he's determined in his heart for god loves a cheerful giver so those things are specifically addressed paul even says to to you know the churches in his letters I, I see that you're keeping special days and i'm concerned about you because of that yeah. so there were there were concerns along those lines because the New Testament believers were keeping special days like Sabbath days. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Yeah. I'm afraid I wouldn't pronounce this name properly. So I'm the next question is uh, asks, can Pastor Paul give an example of God's promises that are not geographical? Are God's promises geographical and spiritual? I'm guessing that this question comes out of um, one of my teachings where I emphasize the fact that the promises that God gave to Israel were geographical. Yes. They were mm -hmm. land-based. They were physical. They yeah. were material. The promised land. The promised land. And the blessings that would go along mm -hmm. with living in the promised land, such yeah. as being able to stand against their enemies, mm -hmm. uh, being able to continue to have good crops, healthy children, and, and so on and so on. And, and I make the point in my teachings that the, the those those are contingent upon their obedience okay yes. in the new testament or the new covenant we aren't given we aren't given geographical promises that are based on the covenant mm -hmm. all right so this person is asking can i give an example of some promises that are not geographical well yeah sure um first john 1 9 if we confess our sins he's faithful and just will forgive us cleanse us from all unrighteousness that's a spiritual promise uh, there are promises related to the holy spirit in our lives there's promises related to power from the holy spirit spiritual power mm -hmm. uh, for those who who uh, you know put their faith in the lord and and so on and so on and so on but what people have to be careful about are separating promises from covenant promises, mm. okay? In other words, there are promises that God gave to Israel that were part of the covenant. Mm -hmm. There were promises God gave to some people in Israel in the Old Testament that weren't part of the covenant. He just simply made a promise to them, Yeah. right? You know, he gave Hezekiah, we were talking earlier, sure. a promise of mm -hmm. an additional 15 years of life. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't a covenant promise. Mm -hmm. It was just a promise, yeah. right? In the New Testament, we have covenant promises which are spiritual in nature. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 1, that our promises, we, he's, he's given us all spiritual blessings, spiritual promises. Then we have promises that are outside of the covenant that could very well be geographical. God may speak to one of his children and say, you know, that piece of land over there that you've been praying for, I'm going to give it to you. I promise to give it to you, right. right? Now, that's a geographical promise, but it's not given as a covenant promise that is for all <clears throat> believers. Covenant promises are for groups who are under the covenant. Right. Personal promises are given to individuals. And so you, ha well, you can't just say promises when you say, does God give promises? Does God give geographical promises? <laughs> Are, you know, what are, you have to specify, are these covenant promises? Now, one of the things that I've made a point about related to physical healing, okay, because that's a physical 
thing is that I've made the point that physical healing is not part of God's covenant promises to believers, right? Now, people, they don't like when I say that. And they'll say, well, the Bible says by his wounds, we are healed. Well, that's not referring to physical healing. If you look up all the references to that passage, the context is spiritual, okay? I don't believe that you can honestly say it is a covenant promise to heal, that every body is gonna be healed. Now, does God promise to heal people? Sure. Yes, I have witnessed physical healings. I have prayed for people who have been healed. So does God promise at times to heal? Absolutely. Is it baked into the covenant so that we can all claim it generally, right? No, I don't believe it's in the covenant because our covenant has spiritual promises according to Ephesians chapter one, right? We've been given eternal life goes way beyond physical healing, right? So yes, God heals and God promises to heal people today, but it's not baked into the covenant for all time and for all people. Okay, great. Brian asks, how might the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh fit into the analogy of the promised land being like the Christian life? Also, was their request ordained by God or was it a subtle sign of rebellion? You know, this is a really good question, but I, yes. I, I've always said, and I'm going to repeat right now, that you have to be careful making analogies yeah. out of every yeah, single right. Bible story. And, and I, don't, I don't think that there is necessarily an analogy here. Was their request ordained by God? Well, it was it was approved by God. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was ordained, I can't tell you. There's nothing to say that mm -hmm. it was preordained. Uh, you know, I mean, he didn't force tell, you know, that some of them were going to settle on the other side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. He gave them permission to do it. Was it a subtle sign of rebellion? Nah, I, I don't think so. I think it was a bad decision on their part. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it was I think probably it was probably a, a subtle sign of convenience. <laughs> it was yeah. clearly convenient for them to just stay there. They liked it. It was good. Can we just stay here? Yeah. You know? I would call it a concession. Sure. Rather than mm -hmm. uh, anything, a, a sign of rebellion on their yeah. part or a preordained act on God's part. Yeah. Bud says you've mentioned in your teachings that any modern Bible translation is good. But in your 1 Timothy 1 teaching, you called the NLT Lucy Goosey, That's which sounds new, like something I would say you that. would yeah. say. Yeah, new living translation, <laughs> by the way. And new. not one that you'd recommend for regular Bible study. Yeah. I also noticed that most pastors don't use the NLT, so you're not alone. What's wrong with the NLT? Our family loves the NLT because it makes the Bible so much easier to understand, and it does, mm -hmm. especially for our teenage children. Children. So uh, the New Living Translation is uh, uh, when when the translators set out to make the New Living Translation, they had a particular goal in mind, and that was not to be not to be as specific to the word of the original language, mm -hmm. but to the meaning. Mm -hmm. And so they gave themselves leeway yeah. to come up with any number of English words that they felt. Uh, made the passage clearer according to its meaning, not according to necessarily its word usage. You have others like the NIV that, that used the same principle, but not to the extent necessarily that the New Living Translation did. They did it somewhat. And, and, and you know, dynamic equivalence comes into all translations at some level, sure. right? Because there, there, are, there are words in the Hebrew and in the Greek that are so dynamic and so full that you simply can't use one single right. English word to describe it. People like to say, I read this Bible because it's a word for word translation. Well, that's really not correct. You could say that they do, they did the best they could to do a word for word mm -hmm. translation. But there, are, again, there are words that just are, they're too full. Yeah. They're too dynamically full. I guess sure. that's the best way I can say it. So the translators still have to do a little bit of searching to find a grouping of English words to describe that one single Hebrew or Greek word. Now, in the New Living Translation, they really gave themselves a lot of leeway. And when I, when I basically say I wouldn't recommend it for serious Bible study, I'm talking about people who really want to get down to word meaning sure. and word usage. Um, 
and, and, and I would recommend something a little bit more like the New American Standard Bible or the ESV or something like that, mm-hmm. even the New King James. Um, but even then, even then, you're, you're going to be better off if you can get a hold of a Greek and Hebrew dictionary where you can look up some of the meanings of those words and get some of the dynamic value out of that dictionary. But, you know, that's the reason. Now, is it is it dangerous? No, I don't think it's dangerous no. at all. Every Bible has its place. And like if I'm going to do an Instagram or Facebook post, NLT is the best because yeah. you can convey the heart of one scripture in a very meaningful way in a few phrases. I've heard pastors joke that the NLT is their commentary. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, just because it does that, yeah. you know. Um, anyway. So, so that's what I think that's important to remember. Every translation has its place. Yeah, every translation. You know, we talked about yes. King James a few minutes ago. That has its place. There's yeah. a place for, um, you know, sometimes just having that, that weight. If you, anyway, every, yeah. everything has a good place. Yeah, it does. And so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is for the serious Bible student who really wants to do some very serious word studies, I would choose something probably other than the NLT, but for family reading, Bible reading, Great. Sure. I, I, I'd say go for it. And don't you no no reason, bud, to stop using it for your your family Bible reading time. Melissa says, hi, Pastor Paul. I'm confused regarding this war in Israel. When I read the Bible, it's clear to me that Jesus doesn't want us killing each other. He's a God of peace and wants us to remain peaceful. So does this mean a born again Christian should not serve in the military? Is going to war a conscience matter? I responded to Melissa personally, but I wanted to include her question Mm -hmm. in this month's Q&A because I think other Christians have it as well. First of all, she says, when I read the Bible, it's clear to me that Jesus doesn't want us killing each other and and what the Bible forbids is murder Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. you shall not murder now speaking of the King James the original King James said you know thou shalt not kill that caused a big problem with a lot of people that was actually a bad translation because the word is murder and a lot of people wondered if it was immoral right. based on that passage to join the military and be part of a military effort. And that's part of what Melissa's asking here. But the fact of the matter is we see military efforts in the Bible. We see God organizing military efforts right. in the Bible. Uh, so I, I do think that it's important for believers today to be very aware of what's going on in the world because I believe that there are morally sound reasons to go to war when a a nation when we're when we're going in to rescue a nation from oppression or something like that Mm -hmm. uh, uh, slavery or, or what have you I think that there are immoral reasons to go to war and I don't so I, I'm not saying that every war is is one. Right. I think it is an issue of conscience. She says, "Is going to yeah. war a conscience matter?" I yeah, I think it is in mm-hmm. in, in many ways. And I and I don't I don't just tell people, "Well, you just got to do it," you know, regard whatever. And you know, you got to pray about it. You have yeah. to seek the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay, Pierre from Johannesburg says, my question is, if we are believers, if we as believers go to be with the Lord when we die, why would we at judgment be judged? Should we not just stay with Jesus and not be judged after death? Well, there's there's a misunderstanding yeah. here of what's going to be happening uh, to believers. Um, believers will will be judged, but not for sins. I've, I've made this point many, many times. Yeah. You, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in Jesus and your and your confidence in what he did on the cross, you will not be judged for your sin, period, Mm -hmm. because Jesus was judged for you already. So what judgment are believers going to be under? Well, we call it a believer's judgment, and it is a judgment of rewards. So you already have eternal life, but God is then going to judge you according to how you used the giftings, abilities, and resources that he gave you Mm -hmm. for his purpose, for his kingdom, and for his glory. And that's the judgment that believers will go through. It is not a judgment of of uh, sins. Believers will not be part of the, the, the white throne judgment um, that is referred to in the Bible. Okay. 
And then another viewer says, I've heard your teachings on the last days, and I know you hold the position that the church will be raptured prior to the Great Tribulation. Does this mean that you believe the church will not have to endure persecution? No, not at all. I'm really glad that this person brought up this question because I do teach that the, the, the catching away of the church will actually usher in that period we call the Great Tribulation. But I do not believe that this means we're not going to suffer persecution. Uh, we are already suffering. We've been suffering persecution for 2,000 years. And, and I believe that it's going to heat up even more. We've got churches today who are suffering persecution. We have believers in parts of the world who are being killed for their faith. This has been happening in communist countries and other places with evil regimes for many, many years, centuries. And I believe it will continue up to the point that the church is removed, you know, from the earth. So no, I do not believe that the church will escape persecution. I believe we will escape wrath. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't believe the church is going to be here during the great tribulation because the great tribulation is a time of God's or the outpouring of God's wrath right. upon the world. And we have not been appointed unto wrath. The Bible says good. Okay, Roxanne, look at this. She asked a question to me. <gasps> look at there. She says, thank you for the lessons you teach. You're an amazing teacher. Hey. That's so sweet. I am blessed. Here's my question. How come you never teach the congregation and only teach women? I'm sure the whole congregation would also be blessed to have you teach them together with Pastor Paul. So, Yasu, yeah, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this could be a very, very long answer, but I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Um, you know, we know that the Apostle Paul told Timothy that I would not have a woman to teach or have authority over a man. But then he went and told Titus, you know, get the women involved, get the older women involved in teaching the younger women. Yeah. So there's clearly a place, uh, a needful place for women to teach. Um, but I... I don't feel like my place is to teach the entire congregation um, based on the word. And then also just, I've been alive through about seven decades now. <laughs> and uh, my observation, first of all, just the created order of how God created the husband, the wife, the family unit, and the understanding of that. My observation is that I don't, I don't, see it profitable. I agree. What I'm trying to say is I agree with the Apostle Paul uh, because he said this in scripture, but also my experience has mm. shown me it is just not it's that profitable. That. Yeah, it's not profitable to have a woman teaching the men all the time. Men don't flourish under that situation. They don't flourish in the home when the wife is the one instructing, yeah. right? That yeah. is not the created order for the home. Yeah. So if they don't flourish in the home, why would we think they're going to flourish in the church yeah. that way? So I'm super content with my role to teach uh, women. And um, I'm also feel like since I'm married to a man who has a great teaching gift, it kind of opens a door to me for effective ministry because I can just kind of, you know, I've often said, in some of my teachings, you know, God gives my husband a mission and I have a sub mission, which is just slightly punny. A play on words. Uh, yes. For... Um, but I do feel like because you have a teaching gift that kind of opens the door for me to have one as well. Because hmm. I have you to keep me in line. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, if I could go on just for a little bit with R Roxanne's question, you know, the Bible says that, uh, that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And so with a position of headship comes a, a, a level of responsibility, which a man is to understand that he has in the home given to him by the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a loving responsibility to lead the family and Paul. And I believe that's why Paul, the apostle said what he said, I do not permit a woman to teach, which is to have authority yeah. over a man because it would allow the church to kind of subvert what God had established in the home, which was the headship of the man. Because when you instruct, when a woman instructs a man, she takes the position of headship. 
Yeah. You know, if, if you were to say, Paul, sit down here now, I'm going to teach you this, you would be taking a headship role sure. over me. Mm -hmm. And Paul is simply saying, no, that's contrary to what the Bible teaches or what role the man has been given in the home, the role that the woman has been given. Are we saying that Sue couldn't teach me? Heavens, no, she could. Uh, women are fantastic teachers. I'm married to one of them. The, the ability to teach is there. The gifting to teach is there. The freedom to teach is not given in the scripture so as to protect the order of the marital relationship in the home. Right. That's what we're saying, yeah. essentially. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks for asking, Roxanne. Yeah. Okay. Shekinah from England says, what's your view on contemplative prayer? For instance, there are apps like Abide Meditation app that produces biblical meditations and prayers for morning and night. I've been reading that these types of apps are new age techniques. These apps aim to focus our minds solely on scripture, but is it best to listen to the word of God instead of utilizing such apps? Well, you know, you have to be discerning. I, I, I don't... I don't look into things like this. Um, contemplative prayer. Well, you know, when you look up, if you were to Google uh, contemplative prayer, the, the description of what it says it is, it doesn't sound very alarming at all because the goal, it seems, of contemplative prayer is to bring people into a closer relationship with God. And people would read that and kind of think, whoa, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, but you, you got to be careful when people kind of come up and start throwing things out. And one thing that I did, I perked up when I read the description of contemplative prayer is that people are to use their imagination oh. to kind of draw closer to God. Well, you know, you got to be careful on some of those things because we've been given something and I should even say someone who is so much superior to all of these apps or methodologies mm -hmm. to draw closer to God. And it is the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible simply says uh, in James that we are to draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Mm -hmm. And I think we just we got to be careful not to kind of overthink it, sure. you know, and, because, and people are good at that, mm -hmm. coming up with a lot of overthinking. And so it's like, you know what, if you want to draw close to the Lord, then cry out to God with your heart and say, Lord, I need to be closer to you. Mm -hmm. I, and so help me to draw near to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not a big person that gets into apps and things like that, that yeah. give, you know, kind of quirky methods of sure. doing things. Jason says, I'm wondering what you think about One for Israel ministry. YouTube has apparently targeted me, and every time I bring up one of your sermons, I see a commercial for One for Israel first. Yeah, they're they're very good. Uh, we, we've watched them together. Sure. I haven't, you know, I've never really delved deeply into their, like, statement of faith or anything, but we've simply watched a lot of yeah. testimonies sure. that are uh, recorded uh, from Jews and even some other Arabs who have... Uh, come to faith in Jesus Christ through extraordinary circumstances, yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. even visions, uh, traumatic yeah. events, so on and so on and so on. We've really enjoyed uh, One for Israel. Um, he also asked about an organization called So Be It, mm -hmm. which I'm not that familiar with. Oh. So mm -hmm. this is this is Jason from Iowa who we had di uh, lunch with. Oh, yeah. hi, Jason. Yeah, that's so. great. Okay, Russell says, James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Too often we only mention the resist part, and we don't talk about submitting to God. Mm -hmm. Satan is powerful, but not as powerful as God. Unless we submit to God, can we truly resist Satan? I think he asked and answered. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people do. Yeah, that's good. A lot of people do in, in, their, in their question. They answer their own question. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. I, I don't think there is any, you know, I mean, they're kind of opposites. Sure. You know, they're, they're opposites. If I'm, if I'm resisting Satan, I'm going to be yielding to yeah. God. And if I'm yielding to God, I'm going to be resisting mm -hmm. yeah. Satan, uh, you know, so yeah. 
one goes with the other, and that's why they're given together in the Word. Good. We might hire him for there our Q&A. There you go. Yeah. Okay, Richard says, I enjoy your videos on the books of the Bible. I have a question in 1 Timothy 6, 3. What do they mean by a different gospel? Our Bible study was a little confused. What he's referring to is 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 4. I don't know what translation of the Bible he was reading, but in the ESV, it goes like this. If anyone teaches a different doctrine mm. and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. And what Paul was saying there in First Timothy was if somebody comes along with a message that is other than that, yeah. a different doctrine, a different teaching other than the one that you've received, then, you know, red alert. Yeah. Now, there is another place in the book of Galatians where uh, it talks about a different uh what does he call different um, gospel? Yeah. And that is in, uh, yeah, like I said, it's in Galatians. I looked up the Greek in those two and it's not the same word, but it is a very similar mm -hmm. word, Greek word. So in the Galatians example of a different gospel, it was obviously people who were accepting the gospel of Jesus plus the law right. of circumcision mm -hmm. and, and other things. Paul called that a different gospel that is no gospel at all. Um, but in any usage like that, whether it's a different gospel or a different doctrine, it's something that, that, that strays from the mm -hmm. teaching of God's word. Okay. Anything that strays. Joe sent us his greetings. Hi, Pastor Paul and Sue. Hope you're both well. Yeah. I have a question about lust. Is it possible to lust after your own wife? Well, not in a sinful sense. It isn't because that's just simply a, a godly desire. A man is to desire his, his wife. And so we don't use the word lust because the word lust is usually given to us or used in a um, negative connotation. Sure. We, we talk about the lusts of the flesh, the the lust of the eyes and the lusting after, you know, a woman that is not yours to, to, to desire. Yeah. And so it is always given in a, a negative sense, but, but not, it's never used concerning a man's wife. No, he's supposed to desire his wife. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, let her please you, let mm -hmm. her, her body, her life uh, please you. And, and so that kind of desire is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, Peggy says, I recently heard a sermon on John 6, 8 to 13, where the preacher said that the barley loaves and fish represent the law and the gospel. The barley bread represents the law and the fish represents the gospel. I've never heard this before and would like to know your thoughts on this spiritual application. You know, what's weird is that it sounds vaguely familiar to me, but I got to... <sighs> I personally think that that is a level of spiritualizing of the text that seems unwarranted. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be careful not to read into things too much or to bring analogies. Now, somebody could bring an analogy and they could clearly say to the people, listen, this isn't what the Bible says, yeah. but I'm going to use this with you right. as an example mm -hmm. of the difference between the law and the gospel. But, but I think a person needs to be careful to say, I came up with this kind of on my own. Yeah. You know, you might say, and in a similar way, yeah. we can see that, yeah. you know, there's, there's some nothing, similarities. There's but, nothing in the Bible right. that would lead you to that conclusion. Yeah. And that's the important thing about keeping those things in line yeah. with the Bible yeah. is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Ayana, maybe, said, Good day, Pastor Paul and Sue. I've been watching your sermons on YouTube, so grateful to have located them. Why did God introduce the Mosaic Law for the children of Israel to follow? Mm, good question. The Bible actually answers this. First of all, in Romans 5.20, it says the law came in to increase the trespass. And that's a fancy way of saying God gave the law to show us just how sinful sin is. Mm -hmm. In other words, to increase our understanding. Yeah. The word trespass means a known law or a known barrier or a line in the sand, if you will, that we then pass. So if I tell my child, don't go past that you know, area right there. Don't cross the street. You can go as far as our sidewalk mm -hmm. and then they do it. That's a trespass. Yeah. 
if I never told them that and I saw my child walking out in the street, I might, I might be angry, but I would withhold punishment because I had never told them, right? Mm -hmm. So the law was a way of God giving us the, the, that line in the sand, mm -hmm. that sense of this is moral, this is immoral, right? This is right, this is wrong. And that's why Paul wrote to the Galatians related to the law. And he said, he, he asked the same question that's being asked here. Uh, why then the law? He said, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So then he says, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under under a guardian. So Paul says the law also served as a moral guardian mm -hmm. until the Holy Spirit would come living inside of us, which takes the place of the external law. Now we have the internal law being written on our hearts. And so the law was given before the Holy Spirit came to indwell. So we see that the law has these various usages, mm -hmm. right? To mm -hmm. help us understand right and wrong, to help help us to to be guided by what is right and wrong so that we would grow up. I, I like to liken the giving of the law much the way Paul did here, the way we treat a small child. Yeah. I was explaining this to someone recently that the, the law is like the way we raise our children. We don't do a lot of explaining on what's right and wrong. We just say, don't do that mm -hmm. or don't touch that. Mm -hmm. um, when they get older, we expect that they're going to grow up in their understanding and no longer need to follow strict rules to keep them safe. They're going to grow up and realize, oh, if I do that, there's going to be bad consequences, yeah. right? And so there's some similarities between how you raise children and how you treat them when they're older versus the law and the life of the spirit. Right. Yeah. Good. And our last question. Oh, is this the end already? Yep. The wow. Ad Adrienne, Adriana says, I love your teaching. My question is, I was listening to 1 Samuel 8, maybe verse 10. Uh, no, it'd be pr probably chapters, chapters 8 through 10. Chapters 8 through 10. Okay. Yeah. What did you mean when you said the sins of the people at that time were not punished? That is a, a reference to what Paul wrote. Uh, in the New Testament related to the sacrifice of Jesus. And let me, let me read that passage for you. Okay. It's Romans chapter three, and I'm going to read this out of the NIV because I kind of like the wording. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him, that's Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, and here's the important part, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Mm -hmm. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So Paul explains there that although Israel went through a sacrificial system, of, of sacrificing animals and the shedding of blood as a picture of that ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would make, all of their sins were left unpunished. They were, uh, there, was a, there was an atonement, a covering, but there wasn't a payment. Jesus came to pay for those sins. Mm -hmm. He paid for sins in the past, in the present, and in the future for those who would come by faith. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what people say. They'll say, well, how were people in the Old Testament forgiven? They didn't know Jesus was going to come. Right. They went through the whole sacrificial system, but they didn't know that Jesus was going to come. Well, but they did have to put faith right. in what they were doing in the sacrificial system. Yeah. God told them yeah. clearly that the blood of, the, uh, of goats and bulls can't take away sins. He told them that. And they had to keep doing Doing it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a once for all act that should have said something to them. I got to do this every time I've mm -hmm. got to do this every year. And the high priest had to go in for all of Israel every year on the day of atonement. So that communicates something. This is ongoing. Mm -hmm. This is ongoing. We got to keep doing this, right? Mm -hmm. 
So they had to put their faith in God to forgive sins, looking toward a more perfect sacrifice that was to come one day. Yeah. We look back on that perfect sacrifice mm -hmm. and we know who made it. It was God's only son, Jesus. They had to look forward by faith to God providing that ultimate perfect lamb for their sins. I'm so glad I live on this side. Me too. I worry sometimes I wouldn't have had enough faith if I had <laughs> been really? on the, yeah, if yeah. I'd have been on the other side. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but God knew where to put me. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, those are our questions and those yeah. and great questions. They were, by yeah, the way, some yeah, really. really, really good ones. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to getting your questions too. So uh, send them along. You can uh, email us office at ccontario.com. Uh, you can go to our website and you can, uh, there's places there to contact us. You can put a question in a comment in our uh, YouTube comments, mm -hmm. and we'll do our best to find those. Those are sometimes a little tougher to find. Uh, and um, let us know what your questions are. We'll do our best uh, to answer them when we do our April yep. Bible Q&A. Now, how about a quick... Uh, telling of oh, how things went in Europe. Yeah, you were so, invited to do a women's retreat. Yeah, so I was invited to teach at a women's retreat in southern uh, Germany, and that was a, it was a fantastic retreat. I was super happy for the ladies in that area because it had been five years for a number of uh, reasons that they weren't able to have a retreat so I was really happy for them but I also want to give a little shout out to my my hosts Edith and Dawn who hosted me before and after the retreat and just knocked themselves out giving me a great time lovely ladies in, in yeah. Germany and France and you know showed me around so I feel like I really got blessed a lot it was you did I and did you, and you even got to pop into France I did and I uh, brought you I something brought you French. something French <laughs> yes we, but before she left I said bring me something French and she did yeah. so anyway yeah. um, it was the best I'm still talking about it I think I bore you sometimes just on the way here I was saying and did you know <laughs> <laughs> it's true she was yeah. yeah so anyway hey thanks so much for joining us today and we will be back with you as we said next month with another Bible Q&A and of course we're with you every week with uh, live teachings and you can also access our through the bible studies through the entire bible uh, if you go to our website you're going to actually find a lot more than you'll find on our youtube channel just go to mm -hmm. ccontario.com and you'll find not only my teachings through the entire bible you'll find audio uh uh, versions of those teachings that you can download when you're offline. And you'll also find study notes and questions on many of our studies through the Bible, as well as finding all of Sue's studies for women, along mm -hmm. with her study guides, which go along with those, which are perfect if you have a small group of women who are going through the Bible as well. So, And I might add, we have a new uh, code. What do you call them? Like a coupon code? What do you call those on your yeah, website? Yeah, it's a coupon code. Yeah. And so if you're buying study guides for like a small group if you buy 10 or more um, you can use wow 10 and get 10 percent off you know obviously we save a little on shipping with the, with a bigger order so wow 10 on the women's uh, study guides if you buy 10 or more and perfect also uh, good friday we will be will we have a live we, we will have a live stream okay, on so good, good friday mm -hmm. so good it's coming friday. up yeah yeah all right hey thanks so much again and we hope to see you soon god bless bye-bye